welcome to uh, this session that I'll be talking about current food standards issues with you. What I'll try to do is um, pick out what I think are the current issues that are likely to have an impact on uh, trading standards and business. Um, if, if someone isn't on mute, would you mind just going on to mute, please? Because I can hear quite a bit of background noise there. That's OK. Thanks. Um, yeah, what I've, what I've tried to do is pick out some uh, issues that I think are likely to have an impact on us over the next few months, both kind of you know, from a regulator and business point of view, as well as other uh, relevant parties. So um, if there is something that you think I've missed, uh, quite happy to take uh, questions later on. Um, as you may have heard myself and Adam talking, if a question comes to mind and you just want to make a note of it in the chat box, Unfortunately, I, I can't actually see the chat box, but Adam will monitor that and then we can answer the questions if it's relevant as we're going along. But if not, um, I can sort of gather them together at the end when I take the um, presentation down. If I can't answer or if I can't or if I don't know or if I can't answer, then what we'll do is questions away <clears throat> and we'll see the answers when I've um, had a look into it and hopefully come up with an answer that will help you. So as I say, the idea of today is really just to provide information and you know raise issues that you may or may not be aware of. And if there is something that I, I kind of say and you think actually that isn't quite as I understood it, then you know by all means uh, join in by the chat box and we can we can talk about it. So um, there's a kind of lot happening. What I've tried to do <clears throat> What I've done is just broken the presentation down into kind of three areas of, of topic. First one is COVID-19, so talk about issues around that. Um, next issue is the post-EU exit transition period, which of course should, will come to um, an end on the 31st of December uh, this year. And then there are some other issues, kind of some of them have been bubbling around for a while. Some of them are reasonably recent, but I just thought I'd mention a few of them just so that you're aware and also hopefully provide some possible avenues that they can be either talked about or discussed or, re or resolved um, in and the processes that you can go through to do that. So, OK, so we'll start with COVID-19. Um, topical, because obviously the new lockdown, um, sorry about the noise, uh, Topical because of the new lockdown period, which is starting today, um, has a number of impacts uh, indirectly on certainly trading standards and environmental health officers' work. Um, the kind of indirect or direct impact is that many officers are being pulled away to carry out duties and enforcement issues around COVID-19 business closures mainly. And although um, from a trading standards aspect of it, that aspect of the work dropped off a little bit during the, the summer months. I know that quite a lot of it, because it related to more of the kind of social distancing issues, fell a bit more heavily. Mental health colleagues who were from uh, the kind of health and safety aspect of it. But now we're back into businesses needing to be closed. Um, we'll be kind of dealing with, with those. And, and again, I think some of the and the resource will be pulled away to deal with that. So um, the FSA have recognised and really from, I guess, part way through or near the beginning of the previous lockdown in March, the, the FSA um, began to realise, I think, that the work was having an impact on the potential resource that could be put into food work. And they have issued um, or just started to issue guidance. That guidance has developed into a series of questions and answers. And if you, um, well, I would hope that most of you can access the Smarter Comms platform because the documentation relating to that is on there. And I think it's, it's really important for particularly um, food lead officers to be aware of what that guidance is telling us because um, my understanding is that the FSA the, the kind of lanes return won't be 
as it has been for previous years. And also when you, I'll be talking later on about the kind of final transition period exit from the EU, but um, there is something around that as well, maybe lanes not being um, the, the kind of required reporting mechanism, but COVID-19 of the situation around it, I think has meant that the FSA have, have realized that the, the level of activity relating to food, both standards and hygiene work has, has fallen. And the additional requirement to kind of report and then prepare the return is one that many authorities will be struggling with. Um, and the level of activity is such that, you know, it will be, I suspect, considerably lower than previous years. So um, the FSA have said that they, they will be gathering data around activity via a survey rather than the more traditional uh, lanes return. But all the details uh, are in the documents on the Smarter Commons platform. I can't remember which version of the question and answer we're up to now, but it's been constantly updated. And there was a communication um, that came out uh, a few days ago, basically referring back to the uh, expectation letter that, that went out in September. And the letter is quite helpful because it does provide fairly detailed guidance around what the expectation from the FSA is around activity, both related to standards and hygiene. So, you know, it's worth definitely being aware of that because that is the framework that the FSA will be using to gather activity data via the survey. So um, there may well be kind of reporting codes and slightly different aspects of that that you may want to um, or already have hopefully incorporated in the recording system. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are with that. Um, the main guidance I think is, is talking about really I think being aware of, and I'll talk a little bit later on about the kind of impact, but you know it's really being aware of what food businesses are are doing because clearly there has been a significant impact on the market sector. So one of the big aspects is obviously looking at the, the high priority uh, businesses, but that could be affected fairly rapidly by what happens and what steps they take to deal with the situation that they're in. So I think what the FSA are saying is that really local authorities should be identifying you know, where the potential higher risk issues are, and then they'll be gathering information about what we've done to deal with those. So um, some of the issues that I talk about shortly will have a, a kind of input into what the, the kind of risk and what the work program potentially looks like. And I, I just think that unlike previous years, um, because of the reasonably constant shifting situation the the kind of risk isn't set in stone anymore it will keep shifting and i think it's trying to be as flexible and um and around dealing with and you know the idea of having a, a kind of set bag of maybe high risk medium whatever uh, risk premises businesses to look at um that has been overtaken slightly by the situation so um, the other aspect of it is that the, the FSA have said that, you know, depending on the situation and, and I think relying on officers' skill and professional judgment, really, um, remote interventions can play a part in this. So there's something about, you know, how you look at uh, what the business is doing via various sources. It, it isn't just a reliance on that kind of face to face physical visit. Um, so. I think what they're saying is that depending on the situation in you know your area and I guess the potential risks that that may be involved in um, a kind of face-to-face -face, uh, visit, there can be a look at what the potential risk is from other sources. So it could be a website, could be through sampling, could be through complaints, could be through other sources of data or information. So I think it's an opportunity to maybe look at these different ways of of doing things. Um, and, you know, when the COVID-19 situation ends, it may well be that, you know, if we find some of these things work, we could maybe incorporate them into 
into the way we work so that we can um, maybe not be so reliant upon physical visits. Physical visits are always, you know, have always got to be an option, but um, there may be other ways we can do things. And uh, that's a, it's a chance to kind of have a look at them. The COVID-19 situation um, has also resulted in, certainly during the first kind of lockdown, it resulted in fairly difficult food supply chain issues, particularly relating to the hospitality sector, where supply chains that have been around for years, just been operating, you know, very efficiently, suddenly um, the supply chain was, was interrupted. And what it meant was that many businesses ended up with food that was being supplied via contract or hospitality uh, outlets were just turning around and saying, well, actually, we, we don't need that anymore. So the wholesaler or the um, distribution chain was then left to deal with lots of supply of food, which wasn't really produced for the retail market. So there was a move around enabling uh, food businesses to to try to avoid as much food waste as we could, to try to get that food into the retail chain. So there was a, uh, a guidance note and there was help around that food information flexibility. And I know certainly from some of the primary authority companies that, that we've kind of dealt with where, where I am, um, they did find that really helpful, really useful. And it was a way of trying to avoid as much food waste as we could really. So, and, and that um, flexibility kind of ended uh, I think it's kind of end of July, but um, I, I don't know this time what's going to happen, but I guess we'll be looking at the situation and if there is a need for that to be maybe reintroduced, it's something that we can keep an eye on and, you know, talk to the FSA if we are getting issues or problems with um, the interrupted supply chain. Because again, I, I get the impression, certainly um, looking at things that, the supply chains have just started to become reinvigorated and then obviously there were kind of local lockdowns and different levels of um, controls in different areas but I think the national lockdown and what that meant for particularly the hospitality to come as a little bit of a kind of bolt out of the blue so I suspect there may well be potential supply chain issues um, in, in the system that may well start to kind of come out in the next few days, um, potentially week or so. So I think it's just a case of keeping an eye on that and feeding any issues and difficulties back to the FSA and DEFRA and talking to them about what can be done really. <clears throat> Looking at things longer term, and I know we've gone down into I've gone into another lockdown, so it's it's kind of difficult to gauge this. But you're kind of wondering what will happen once we do get to a position where things do return to something like we would previously call normal, and and what the food will look like when it happens. We've already seen a number of food businesses going out of business. Um, you know, impact on the hospitality sector I've already mentioned. And I think, you know, potentially there could be um, issues issues around that. And from, it has a number of kind of impacts on local authorities. Um, clearly, you know, from a local authority point of view, local authorities want businesses that are able to thrive and grow. So there will be um, issues around that um, economic problem within local areas where businesses have gone out of business, both from you know, national chains, but also local, smaller local businesses as well. So from a regulatory point of view, you know, clearly um, there are also potential issues around that because the it's happening already and it happened during previous lockdown, but businesses will um, and have been able to diversify. And I think quite a few of them did it quite quickly. From the hospitality point of view, that did cause issues around where you were suddenly moving from table service to um, delivery. And 
there were kind of potential issues around, I think in particular, we were concerned about allergen issues, provision of allergen information where, you know, maybe the system that the business had got was able to work pretty well for table service and potentially, you know, some um, lower levels of, of um, orders by telephone or um, people just kind of walking in and ordering. Um, certainly there was a sector, uh, a part of the hospitality uh, industry or sector where, you know, they weren't really geared towards providing that information in a way that was appropriate. So, um, you know, potentially there were issues around that. And I think it is where the businesses diversify that potentially there are going to be issues. And it's something that, you know, if we can be aware of and it is trying to get as much information out there uh, as we can so that at least businesses can access that um, and, you know, wherever possible provide um, support for them to to be able to do that and quite a few um, you know other food businesses uh, you know started looking at different delivery models which always takes a bit of time and it'll be interesting to see with this lockdown um, how many takeaway oh well sorry how many um, restaurants kind of start to look at that uh, delivery side of things again and uh, you, know, you do wonder if when we move forward potentially there will be fewer businesses but also there may well be fewer businesses but they could be delivering food to consumers in slightly different ways um, and you know the kind of well I'll talk about the aggregators as they're called later on so just eat and delivery people like that but again you know they have probably done um, they've been okay i think because they probably had an increase in in business during this and though i kind of hesitate to use you know the phrase people have done okay but certainly the you know the retail food shops um have been very busy and so in terms of their um turnover i guess that that has not really been as as badly hit as uh the restaurants who, who have been um made to close down. Um, the current situation is, um, as I understand it, uh, takeaways can still um, serve and deliver after certain times. The, the rules are n not as easy to understand as perhaps they could be. Um, so I think there will be something around businesses maybe not quite being clear about what the requirements are. So again, it's, it's something that can be um, a source of support and obviously as we're the ones who will be <clears throat> potentially enforcing those particular rules as well as the police then that's a, a role for us um, with regard to that. The regulation and econ economic recovery I think it is and I think I've kind of touched upon the fact that you know businesses in certain sectors have been quite badly hit and you, you can't help but feel that there will be a tension between um, the level of regulation and the economic recovery because um, say local authorities, central government want businesses to be able to um, you know get back into and hopefully grow business so in terms of regulation will there be um, and I don't know so this is just speculation really you know will there be um, pressure maybe to perhaps look at ways that we can um, ease regulation in certain areas or maybe have a lighter touch around uh, certain requirements. Um, don't know yet, but it's just something flagging up for the future that that may well be <clears throat> something that will come out of central government because, you know, I, I think we can see that there is going to be a kind of major, a major issue around, you know, the economy and, and how that does recover. So. We shall see, and, and certainly in the kind of in food food world, uh, as I say, I think it is the the kind of hospitality sector that um, has has kind of really bore the brunt of the the problems. Um, the impact on local authority resources. I've already mentioned the fact that you know officers are being taken away from food work to deal with um, deal with the COVID nineteen business closure issues, but also 
with the economic issues coming in and businesses no longer being able to trade, if a local authority does have, you know, uh, business advice or um, primary authority partnerships, then uh, an indirect um, impact may be that <clears throat> the ability to recover costs from primary authority partnerships may well be reduced as well. So in a way, it's a kind of not as an obvious um, impact as officers being pulled away to do other work, but there may well be other perhaps more indirect impact that the situation has that really don't help with the resources that we've got and potentially you know what we can do around building building resource as well so and I think quite a few authorities have have kind of if you have been charging for advice before I think you've kind of um, maybe waived some of those, those uh, cost recovery aspects of it so again it's, it's not income but it's just um, you know, money that, that isn't going to be coming into the into the service. So it's just an awareness that um, you know there are other potential resource impacts as well, as well as officers not being able to do food work. So <clears throat> um, <laughs> as as if we have enough to deal with COVID nineteen, um, clearly and. You know, on the first slide of this, it's talking about EU exit. And um, from the messages coming from central government, there doesn't seem to be any potential for uh, movement on the post transition date. So, to all intents and purposes, it looks like we will be exiting the transition period on the 1st of December. You know, it will it will have an impact. We don't know exactly what the size uh, and nature of that will be yet. So some of this is still speculation, um, but it's hopefully reasonably informed speculation. And as we'll see, as I kind of move on through the presentation, the end result is largely dependent upon things that haven't happened. So some of this could change, um, but it's kind of the, the best that we know of the situation at the moment. So um, hopefully you'll be aware of this. Um, a few years ago, two or three years ago now, um, CTSI put together a, a group of lead officers to deal with aspects of trading standards work that would be more directly affected, I think, by the departure from the EU and produced this, this document um, the web page on the CTSI website is kind of being updated. To be honest, um, it's been tweaking because reality is since the decision or the referendum that decided we were to leave the EU, um, not a lot of substance has actually happened, to be fair. And so that document, although was written, put together a few years ago now, um, is still relevant and things are maybe looking to be a little bit more resolved, but most of the information in that um, document is still relevant. So, you know, if you are kind of wondering or having a think and you haven't read it, then, you know, I, I would commend the document to you to have a look. It's a really good overview of um, the potential impacts and a realization that I think we, we all kind of know anyway, but it really brings home how much trading standards work is connected to EU derived uh, legislation and guidance. So, and as I say, the, the website is, is being updated. Um, recently, um, DEFRA, there was kind of talk about a, a kind of transition guidance and the link there to the website is is very much around um, quite a, a reasonably detailed guide around use of um, things like organic um, symbols and other issues that are going to be directly and immediately affected by um, excuse me EU exit. Some things will happen straight away. So, for instance, the the organic label, um, the, the guidance is. And I think it's mainly because it's kind of copyrighted by the EU. So from 1st of January, um, you won't be able to use the organic label. 
Um, other things like protected geographical indications will be affected as well, potentially around that protection. Um, one of the, the parts that is actually a transition is that DEFRA have put in their guidance that the name and address, because once we leave the EU, as I'm sure you know, all of you appreciate, one of the biggest changes will be the, the requirement for a name and address because currently the EU legislation talks about a name and address of the food business in the EU. Clearly, when we leave the transition period, um, I'll say Great Britain, because we'll talk about Northern Ireland in a second, but Great Britain um, won't be part of that regime anymore. And so if you've got, if you export to the EU, if you've got a name and address in Great Britain, that will no longer be uh, legal for um, exporting to the EU. For goods coming into Great Britain, DEFRA has to if you address Ireland, then that will be permitted uh, until the 30th of September 2022. So effectively, what it's doing is giving businesses, uh, and this is really as a result of the fact that there is so much uncertainty still around what is happening with trade deals, and I'll talk about that in a second, but because of the uncertainty, businesses just didn't have time to put things in place. Um, and there's a kind of whole piece of work around businesses who export into the EU, setting up addresses and companies in the EU so that they could keep or have a name and address within the EU. But um, as, as we'll see in a second, what happens when goods go into the EU, we have no real influence over as things stand at the moment. But for goods coming into Great Britain, then DEFRA have issued the guidance that says, um, you know, there will be this allowance from 1st of October 2022, uh, goods sold in the U in Great Britain will need to have an address in the UK. Um, and again, that's related to the Northern Ireland protocol. So, but definitely worth having a look at that guidance if you've not looked at it already, um, because there is, uh, it, it goes through quite a few different aspects of um, legislation that is directly influenced by, or is directly relevant from the EU legislation. Um, as part of the work the, of the Brexit think tank, we, we kind of try to think about things that could be opportunities and um, you know looking at it in a positive way and one of the aspects we came up with was that it would be a chance to simplify the central government structure so rather than having the food standards agency DEFRA and Department of Health and Social Care looking after legislation that we deal with in regard to food standards it would make far more sense to bring all of that back into the food standards agency and um, you know, I think, as we said, the, the clues in the name, really, and it would make things far more cohesive and easier to deal with, because at the moment, Food Standards Agency is a non-ministerial department. DEFRA and Department of Health and Social Care are, so they do have different ways of dealing with policy. They do have different processes and trying to deal with them is is you do have to approach it in slightly different ways, which isn't helpful. They do liaise, to be fair. It's not about the people, it's about the structure. They do liaise, talk to each other and try to make sure that there is consistency. But I think it's the ministerial input that sometimes means that things perhaps happen in a way that you think, well, actually, is that the best way to go? Also an opportunity maybe for trading standards to build on maybe business advice, because it could be a chance to actually show businesses that, you know, I think businesses who have dealt with us in the past realise that, you know, we do try to find solutions. It's not just about stopping people doing things. It's about saying, well, if you can't do it like this, maybe you can do it like that. And maybe for businesses who are still, you know, they've got that barrier around, well, I don't want to talk to a regulator because I don't want to necessarily hear what they've got to say. It might be an opportunity to show them that actually, you know, we, we do look for solutions most of the time, not ways of stopping things happening. Also an opportunity to amend legislation. So where there are things that maybe we've accepted as a compromise because of the nature of the EU process, um, it's an opportunity to perhaps look at changes for the domestic market. 
clearly, if you're exporting to the EU, you don't, this is irrelevant because you've got to comply with the EU legislation. So this is purely for kind of domestic market purposes. And there's a link to the think tank document. Um, number of concerns. Um, we don't know, as I've touched upon, don't know how member states will deal with our exports. We just don't know. Um, how will the UK system has worked? That's becoming a little bit clearer. Um, for things like nutrition and health claims and for novel food applications in particular, um, there is, or people have been appointed to the relevant bodies to consider those claims. As I understand it, I think there is still a little bit of uncertainty about what the actual process is. And again, as we get closer to 31st of December, for, and this kind of links in with um, CBD issues I'll talk about later on, but if you're looking to start to get a novel food approved at the moment for a business, it's quite a difficult decision whether to go for EU approval or look at UK. What the FSA have said is that if you apply to the um, EFSA through the EFSA system, if you contact the FSA and let them know what's happening, then that may well enable them to perhaps pick up the application uh, if it's not been uh, dealt with before or by, by the 31st of December this year. So again, businesses, it's useful um, to stay in contact with the FSA and just let them know what's happening. Uh, again, you know, people have been appointed to the bodies, uh, but we still aren't too sure about what the actual mechanisms are to, to deal with that. Um, the impact trade deals we have on our standards. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, we, we We've had the Japanese deal, which to be honest, doesn't really, I don't think has a huge impact. Um, clearly, most of the news has been around, you know, a possible trade deal with America. Um, and we still, well, I don't think we do anyway. We still don't know what's happening there, really. And so you kind of get the impression, you know, if Donald Trump wins, it could be chlorinated chicken. If Joe Biden wins, it may be that we don't get any kind of deal at all. So it's a certainty and we just don't know what's going to happen. And um, in relation to the impact, the, the government, and again, for those of you who've been following it, the Agriculture Bill currently um, was called for it to have a clause in there which effectively in, in law protected the kind of food standards and, ag and animal welfare standards that, that we've currently got. The government have said they want to protect them but aren't prepared to put that into law. So what they've done is set up this thing called the Trade and Agriculture Commission, which has got a number of representatives from different bodies, including the NFU. And their role apparently is to look at potential trade deals and advise the government as to what impact that could have on food standards and um, animal welfare standards. They don't have any legal powers, I think, to do anything if they don't. But the government have said because it's a legally established body, they have more influence than if they weren't. But um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Um, must admit, I'm a bit sceptical, to be quite honest, because, you know, they can advise. But, you know, if there's a really good trade deal on the table and there has to be compromised, I suspect that it, it may well be the trade deal that wins rather than the standards. But I could be proved wrong, but we'll see. As I said there, a lot of uncertainty. We don't have a trade deal yet with the European Union. The immovable deadlines have been moved several times and we are still in a position where I think we're kind of looking at mid-November, I think, as the next final deadline. So we'll see what happens. And if we get a deal, that will potentially have an impact on some of the things that we've talked about already in with regard to how easily goods are able to kind of move in and out of uh, Europe into Britain as well, and also what um, compromises are made around, um, you know, standards and et cetera. So we'll see until we get the detail. If we get a deal, it's quite difficult to kind of um, give any uh, huge uh, pieces of information about that. So it's really just watch the space and we will try to get stuff out as soon as we know what's happening, just to hopefully um, help people because you know for businesses it generally speaking businesses hate uncertainty and this is just you know we've got to a point now where any any kind of changes will they will need some kind of support and um and ability to perhaps have stuff on the marketplace that isn't quite compliant but 
again, we'll need to deal with that as we as we move along uh, liaising with central government. Um, one of the concerns is that potentially, again, because things are being left until very late in the day, you know, from not knowing what's going to happen, suddenly we'll probably know what's going to happen. And then understandably, there'll probably be a huge um, flood of questions about what can happen and what can't. So um, again, we're sort of a little bit concerned about the our ability to deal with all those queries in the timescales that we would like to. So um, devolution issues, mentioned those because um, again, for those of you who have been kind of looking at it, the internal markets bill has caused real issues and in theory, really good idea around making sure that trade between England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Ireland is as smooth as can be because food standards is a devolved issue, therefore Scotland and Wales Northern Ireland can make slightly different legislation. Previously, the EU umbrella helped to prevent things being too diverse, but now that's gone. It will be a case of saying, well, you know, if Wales and Scotland want to go separate ways in certain ways. So, and things like the, um, I know it's not food, but it kind of relates to food. The alcohol unit pricing in Scotland is an example where maybe um, the nations uh, divert. Sorry, I'll just move my cat. There you go. Um, but to try to avoid that, the government proposed this idea of a commission to examine potential new legislation and make comments around whether or not they thought it was OK. In theory, it sounds really good, but I think from a Scottish Welsh uh, point of view, it, it, they kind of see it as effectively taking away their devolved powers because, you know, what, what they're saying is, well, we want the ability to do that. Um, but this commission potentially is just going to say, well, no, you can't do that because it diverges too far from the English rules, therefore. So the, that, there's a whole argument about that, and that's still kind of unresolved, really. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. But potentially, if the internal market bill does get passed, um, there could be some uh, real political issues coming up in the near future. The other concern is potential for food fraud because um, border controls potentially will be relaxed for the first six months. That's the message that the government is putting out. Therefore, you know, will that mean that people will try to get food that isn't what it says it is across into Great Britain? It's an opportunity. And also access to intelligence at the moment. We potentially don't have access to some of the databases and some of the coordination that we have with Europe at the moment. So again, this could be potentially dealt with through a trade deal, but if not, um, we will lose uh, a significant access to information and intelligence. So it's kind of something that hopefully a trade deal, if we get one, could, could deal with. So that's kind of dealing with where we are, I think, with um, the post-transition period. Um, there are lots of other kind of potential issues, but as I say, until we start to get more detail, it's quite difficult to uh, give concrete answers to some, some questions. Uh, but the DEFRA document is definitely worth a look. Um, other regulatory issues. This is just a kind of rag bag of things that I thought, you know, it's worth just being aware of if you aren't already. Um, the first one, the lockdown and the COVID-19 situation, not just in food, in the food sector, but so generally I've seen the growth in e-commerce. And I think that it's something that as a as a kind of profession, um, we've been struggling with for a, a number of years now. And it really is about how we deal with this growth of e-commerce. And, you know, do we need to look at how we were touched upon it earlier with, you know, the Food Standards Agency saying that perhaps remote interventions, looking at websites, taking sampling via um, mail order, that kind of thing. Um, it, are these ways that we can deal with e-commerce because you know there are it is more difficult because you aren't dealing with bricks and mortar so if you get a complaint about a website sometimes it's it's just not as easy to deal with as dealing with a, a retail premise because you know if you can go and see them or ring them or get in contact with them uh, and actually you know just do a kind of face-to-face -face, even, even if it's virtually that can um, at least enable you to make that connection. But with e-commerce, there are lots of issues that I think we, 
in the coming years, we need to kind of look at how we work, how we're structured, what skill sets that, that we have, and just really look at how we deal with that, that whole kind of market sector, because it is growing, it's not going to go away. And sadly, you know, when you look at some of the high streets these days, um, you know, the, the retail premises probably will still have a part to play, but their, their kind of function and um, profile will probably change. Um, leaving the EU, I, I guess, connected to that is the increased need for market surveillance because, you know, a lot of the work that goes on at EU level around market surveillance, we won't be able to do anymore. The FSA have already funded some sampling programmes uh, to look at potential issues relating to different foodstuffs. Um, but again, you know, it's a kind of slight concern that, you know, will we have the resource uh, if the FSA aren't able to carry on with that funding? You know, will local authorities um, see that as a... A role because if it's a national potentially national impact will local authorities see that as something that maybe should be uh, directed and supported and coordinated nationally um, I think it's a fair argument and that's certainly something that we'd be looking for from a kind of CTSI point of view it makes sense you know because local authorities just don't have the capacity or resource to look at that kind of national national level um, I mentioned already the reduced access to intelligence. Um, that's mainly around the kind of EU side of it. Um, but potentially with um, the kind of, uh, you know, devolved nation issues as well, will there be coordination there? Um, now, ABC, achieving better, uh, sorry, achieving business compliance. Um, the Regulate Our Future programme that the FSA are running around looking at how food standards and food hygiene work is delivered has now kind of morphed into, uh, I think it's phase two, which is being called Achieving Business Compliance. And um, there are, there is a kind of um, developed a new risk scheme, which certainly for food standards, I think is more fit for purpose and really reflects the risk that the food business poses to the market rather than uh, concentrating on a premise or a physical um, aspect of it. And to me, that makes, you know, we've just been talking about e-commerce. You know, the person sat at home ordering stuff on the computer, could be anything, could be food, could be hair dryers, could be whatever. You know, the traditional risk assessment doesn't really deal with them particularly well. So what we're looking for and what we've, we've kind of worked with the FSA on is a risk scheme that I think really addresses the potential threats to the marketplace moving forward and really will enable us to do interventions that we feel are more relevant because you know certainly sometimes the current risk scheme does result in visits to food businesses who you kind of think actually they you know they've got really good systems and the fact that they're a manufacturer well you know why does that mean they are potentially higher risk so at the moment unfortunately the pilot projects with um, 20 authorities, I think 12 of whom were going to use the new scheme, eight were going to be control uh, services just to kind of been able to compare data. Um, they've been delayed now until at least January. Hopefully that, that will kind of enable or we'll be able to kind of get on with those. Um, but uh, and, and I must admit, kind of to give credit to the FSA where it's due, they do want to do these pilots for a year so they get a good set of data to look at and really kind of assess um, what seems to be working and what doesn't. And, uh, you know, I think it'd be really interesting. And, you know, I'm hopeful that looking forward, it will mean that, you know, we can deliver food inter well, food standards interventions in a way that is more suited to the way the marketplace is developing, but also hopefully try to secure resource from local authorities because we can show that, you know, we are looking at good outcomes rather than just um, delivering numbers. So. Um, hopeful for that. Sampling, um, you know, an issue, public analysts are kind of rapidly disappearing, really difficult issue, but sampling has got to be an essential part of food standards work. And again, it's really trying to hang on to the resource that we've got, trying to make sure that we can try to build on that. And again, working with the FSA to really try to build that and looking at what the FSA can do to support it. And it's kind of Fallen by the wayside a little bit, but you know we 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 are very aware of that and want to carry on developing that that work. Um, Prepack for direct sale and allergen information. I mention it because 
Um, the new legislation will come into force 1st of October next year. The FSA did a, a, a promotional campaign uh, 1st of October this year, just to kind of put it out there. But again, real challenges for um, potentially smaller businesses, real challenges for local authorities, because they're the ones who perhaps need most support. Um, but clearly a really important piece of, of work and something that, you know, we need to be aware of and really, I guess, start to put the um, building blocks in place for, for how we're going to deal with that. Um, we've already mentioned aggregators and fulfillment houses. Um, just Eat, Deliveroo, um, Uber, et cetera, and the issues that they have and what responsibility they have for the food that they deliver, you know, what can that expectation be? And we're still kind of really trying to um, bottom out what that means. Fulfillment houses, we are still looking at them. There is an item, we've got a food standards uh, and information focus group meeting on the 12th. Fulfillment houses is on the agenda. And it's something that we're really keen to try to get a more definitive opinion. There is an opinion relating to more product safety that um, NTS, I think, got from council a while back. But because of the slight difference in the wording of the food law, we really wanted to try to um, get uh, an opinion or guidance from central government about, you know, their their opinion about what responsibility a fulfillment house has because to be quite honest i think it's like it's like you know to just eat and delivery they don't see themselves as food businesses so they don't really fit within the kind of traditional framework of the legislation and the definitions so it's really trying to um fit innovative ways of of kind of doing business into existing legislation but to do that we we need some really kind of good guidance and uh, an agreed opinion from uh, central government that, that we can then work with. Um, CBD, sorry, CBD regulation. Um, FSA clarified the position. Um, CBD or CBD oil products and ingredients will need to be approved under the novel food regime. Um, they've indicated to businesses that this will need to be in place before the 31st of March next year. And I think that is really, you know, they've got an application in place and it is being processed. So if a business hasn't done that, then 1st of April uh, 2021, the products will not be legal. And we've got various enforcement regulatory tools in the novel food regulations to deal with them you know, ranging from fixed penalty notices through to stop selling orders through to the novel foods regulations uh, potentially offer a real kind of diverse range of ways of dealing with this issue. So, and again, we're talking about this at the focus group next week, really around kind of expectations and, you know, what enforcement approach the FSA uh, would feel comfortable with. I mentioned the obesity strategy again, go back to COVID-19. This kind of came out, I think, of COVID-19. Obesity strategy has kind of withered on the vine recently, but then uh, I think there was a realization that COVID-19 had an impact on people who um, were clinic or were kind of obese uh, at a higher level than, than uh, people who weren't. So that seemed to produce a level of activity. We've seen this strategy in terms of practical application, we haven't really seen that much coming out of it yet, but it's a kind of watch this space. Part of it, though, is, I guess, the calorie labelling in catering establishments requirement that, that will be coming in. And we've been talking to um, Department of Health and Social Care about how that can be enforced and what type of enforcement they're looking for. And initially, they seem to be saying, well, you know, it really is about checking they've got the information there, but also looking at how they've got that. So a number of issues to unpack there, but there is ongoing work on that and there will be guidance um, coming out around that when the, the regulations um, do sort of uh, finalise. Um, on health, on hold health claims, I mentioned these because um, when we leave the EU, um, sitting within the EU is, a, I think it's about 1,500 claims that have just been put on hold because EFSA, haven't been able to deal with them. And um, Department of Health and Social Care aim is to ask for calls for evidence and try to deal with them so that 
I think the aim is by September next year to have dealt with as many of the on hold claims as, as we can. Until then, I think the guidance is that they can continue to be used. Um, but, um, you know, food businesses will be will need to be putting in um, evidence to get them uh, looked at and potentially approved through the system that that will be the UK system. I mentioned the use by date case. That was a Tesco case where, again, they, sorry, again, they appealed against a uh, prosecution by Birmingham on the basis that um, we, they had to prove that the food was unsafe after being sold after the use by date. After the Torfan case, which was based on the old set of regulations, this came up under new regulations, but the court said, actually, no, it's a deemed, um, deemed fact that if a food is sold after it's used by date it's unsafe you don't have to prove it's unsafe which kind of is the position that we were with Torfan so that's just reinforced that and then I think Tesco were I think it was Tesco was subsequently prosecuted by Bracknell Forest I think for um, more use by date offences after that so it's quite interesting. Um, I've mentioned this already really future government approach to regulation you know are we looked at as a positive way of dealing with the marketplace or, you know, red tape? And I think it's a discussion to be had. The constant innovation in the sector is, is a constant challenge. You know, it's good, but it just means that sometimes the legislation gets left behind and, you know, we have to uh, mould definitions to things that it wasn't really intended for. And then really fitting in with the first point on that slide, you know, funding post-COVID near your exit, um, you know, we've been spending a lot of money. How's that going to be? How's that going to be got back? Um, are local authorities going to um, be invested in, or you know, are we seen as a way of saving money? Don't know. So I just throw those out there as don't wanna, don't wanna depress people too much. Sorry to end on a sort of uh, low note on that slide. Um, just mention these. Hopefully, you'll be aware of these. Food Standards and Information Focus Group, that's the regional representatives. The route through that, if you've got a query, is talk to your regional group. If it can't be agreed, they can then refer it through to the focus group who will look at it and come up with an opinion. Um, most of those end up being uh, AXO badged, so, you know, gives it a little bit of, um, gives it a bit more um, weight, I guess. Business Expert Group is a kind of parallel group to the focus group, consists of trade association members, and, um, yeah, we work with them developing opinions just to get a kind of business uh, input on, on an opinion. And then obviously primary authority and the various groups around that. I uh, mentioned CTSI, obviously, um, FSA, DEFRA, Department of Health and Social Care for guidance. And then also I mentioned the Nutrition and Health Payments Compliance Roundtable, which is a group consisting of trade associations, the FSA, MHRA, ourself, CTSI, and um, it looks at the kind of We've been aware that there is a gap in nutrition and health claims enforcement for a number of years, unless there is fraud involved. So they're trying to deal with um, the maybe lower level non-compliances. But I put something on the knowledge hub about the the compliance round table, and I would I would kind of urge you to have a look at that because if you've got a question, if the food business is a member of a trade association, you know those trade associations are really keen to to help us bring them back into compliance. So you know worth a look. Um, especially where we are all kind of hard pressed with with time often they can help with um, interpretation so as I say there's a an entry on the knowledge hub about that um, and that's it sorry I've overrun slightly I said 45 minutes but I've talked a bit too much but um, I'll end the presentation there and just